Hello, everybody, and happy National Fossil Day. Welcome to our Let's Tour live stream presented by the ALF Museum and the Western Science Center. Um, we are your hosts. I am Gabriel Santos from the ALF Museum of Paleontology, and joining me, as always, is Brittany Stoneberg from the Western Science Center. Hello. <laughs> So it's our National Fossil Day live stream event. And today we are asking the question, why are museum collections important? So for most people, when they think about museums, they only think about the exhibits on display, but really that's just a small part of museum collections. Uh, to answer that question, we have to go behind the exhibits. Uh, and that's what we're gonna do. Today, we're taking a virtual trip of museums across the US uh, to answer the question and to celebrate National Fossil Day. And just as a reminder, since we are in a global pandemic, we are all, all of us paleontologists are taking the utmost care and precaution during our virtual live streams today to help prevent the spread. Um, so just, we're all, you know, doing this virtually and we all made sure that we, you know, so social distance and isolated while doing these virtual tours. Uh, so let's get started on our very next stop, our second stop today. Let's welcome our virtual host from the University of Michigan uh, Paleontology, Dr. Jen Bauer. Hello, Jen. Hi, Gabe. Hi, Brittany. It's good to be here. Hello. Good to see you, Jen. Great to have you. How are things going over there for you? Pretty good. It's a little bit lonely. I work alone most often, uh, but it's nice to have all of my specimens with me. <laughs> oh, us collections people, we love sometimes a little bit of that alone time with our collections, huh? <laughs> the only company you need. <laughs> Okay, so today uh, for the University of Michigan tour, you gave us a pre-recorded video, right? Yes. Okay, cool. So for those of you watching, we'll have the pre-recorded video, but all of us will be on the live chat to answer questions. And at the end of the pre-recorded video, we will have a live Q&A with Dr. Bauer. So make sure you stay tuned and we can ask and answer questions then. So let's get started. Here we go on our virtual tour stop of the University of Michigan Paleo. Hi everyone, my name is Jen Bauer, my pronouns are she, her, um, and I'm very excited to be here today and like to quickly thank Gabe and Brittany for this excellent opportunity. So I'm here at the UM Museum of Paleontology located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, um, and I'm going to share with you today some of the history of paleontology at UM, talk a little bit about how we're organized as a unit, uh, walk you through our collection space and organization in the invertebrate range, and then I'll also kind of point out or highlight some very cool and important specimens. I hope you enjoy it. The UM Museum of Paleontology is a slightly different museum from how we normally envision museums. It is a research museum where our primary visitors are scholars conducting research. We loan our specimens to be put on display at the UM Museum of Natural History. The facility is not publicly accessible, as in people cannot walk in, but it is available by appointment. Not long ago, the collections were moved into this renovated facility that is off campus with several other campus collections. Each department has their own space and each space is secured with card access. So without proper authorization, I couldn't simply go visit my friend Randy in the zoology fish collection. Here at the UMMP, we hold several paleontological collections, vertebrate, invertebrate, paleobotany, and micropaleontology. Today, I will walk you through the invertebrate paleontology collection and the micropaleontology collection is sort of folded into this collection space. We have specific strengths in early Paleozoic corals, ostracods, and brachiopods, and we also have a really great collection of Mesozoic mollusks, so that includes clams, ammonoids, and snails. Here I am heading into the collection space from our open laboratory. The collection is kept at a specific temperature and humidity that best suits the specimens that are stored here. Many of our specimens contain pyrite or fool's gold. This is quite beautiful, but if it gets really humid, the pyrite can spread almost like a fungus and this can destroy the specimens. So we keep the humidity low to avoid this. However, that makes our entryways sort of feel like hospital airlocks. Our cabinets are stacked too high. In order to access things up high, we use ladders, a lift, or a large platform that we have to examine fossils well up high. We have over 550 cabinets in this space. 
each filled with quite a few drawers, depending on the size of the specimens being stored within them. There is an estimate of over 2 million fossil specimens. The specimens are subdivided into three major collections, type, systematic, and stratigraphic. I'll walk you through each of these collections. First up, we have the type and figured collection, which holds material that has been published in peer-reviewed journals. So this means they have a catalog number and have been referenced or imaged in an article. All of our cabinets are kept locked unless we are working in them. The type collection is organized taxonomically, so this cabinet is filled with tabulate corals. The tabulate corals within the cabinet are then organized alphabetically. You can see this cabinet isn't completely filled with drawers and some space is needed for larger specimens. We have an excellent collection of fossil corals from the Middle Devonian. Some of these corals have been cut and thin sections were made to examine their internal structures in greater detail. Those are all inside of the small boxes with white labels. Each of these drawers has the same organization, just sometimes a different amount of specimens depending on the sizes and shapes of fossils that need to fit into the drawer. Now we will head over to the systematic collection, which holds material that has been on display in the UM Museum of Natural History or used for other comparison purposes that required the specimens to be separated out from the stratigraphic or other collections. This collection is organized by major animal group or systematically. Most of the time, the groups are then organized alphabetically, but sometimes they are by time period or a thesis project. This cabinet holds some of our trilobite specimens. You'll notice that there are more tightly packed drawers in this cabinet. Many of the trilobites can fit in the size of the drawer and aren't really as tall as some of the corals. These trilobites are also organized alphabetically. We have many beautiful phacopid trilobites from the Middle Devonian. Most of these are from various collecting trips over the years. You'll notice that these are stored in different boxes than the type collection. The white boxes from the type collection are archival and will last a very long time, whereas these black ones will degrade. So we've been upgrading them. We've just started with the type collection. Now we are heading into the stratigraphic collection, which is organized by formation or layer of time in the rock record. We have specimens ranging from the Cambrian all the way to the recent. However, the real strength in our collection is in the Paleozoic. Of all of this material, about 50% is Middle Devonian. That's around 400 to 380 million years ago. This is a nice cabinet from the silica formation. You can see each drawer has a nice label explaining the contents of the drawer. We include the time, formation, collecting event, and anything else relevant for a potential visitor. Inside the drawers are what we refer to as lots, or groups of specimens. Not all of these specimens have specific catalog numbers or individual labels but the groups do have more information. These may look like takeout containers, but they're archival and are really great for loose specimens. This whole row is filled with the silica formation. In order to maximize space in our collection rooms, cabinets are stacked and also on rolling tracks. So when we need to get to a different area of the collection, we need to physically roll the cabinets back and forth. This is not difficult to do, although sometimes you can tell that some of the cabinets are much heavier than others. In this instance, I am opening up one of our Devonian rows to give you a peek inside. I've pulled some interesting and or important specimens from our collection to share with you all. As I mentioned before, the UMMP has strengths in the Paleozoic, specifically the Devonian. However, we do have an excellent Mesozoic cephalopod collection and some really beautiful ammonoids. Here I have pulled out two ammonites. You may notice that one has some distinctive holes in the shell. This specimen is quite special as it records behavior, such that it was bitten by a predator, which has been interpreted to be a mosasaur. If you want to examine this specimen in closer detail, you can through our online fossil repository. A really common and well-preserved Middle Devonian brachiopod is Parasporifer. These are often really robust critters that are often found with pyrite replacement and or nodules or with other critters encrusting or living on their shells. This includes corals, bryozoans, and even other brachiopods. We also have several Parasporifer examples online with different encrusters. 
An animal that doesn't often get enough time in the limelight are ostracods. Ostracods are related to shrimp and other crustaceans and are commonly called bivalved shrimp. Like most arthropods, they molt and shed their exoskeleton, leaving behind an extraordinary fossil record. These are usually very small and are mounted on slides for identification and examination, as you can see with these Devonian examples. However, in the Ordovician, there were some quite large specimens. These are about the size of a kidney bean. Lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Michigan State Stone, the Petoskey Stone. Here's a beautiful example of the raw coral, Hexagonaria. This is a colonial rugose coral from the Devonian that can commonly be found as very weathered pebbles on the beaches of the Great Lakes. We have a nice example of this coral on Eumorph as well. As the National Fossil Day artwork incorporates a beautiful Permian reef, I would encourage you to explore our new virtual dioramas on Eumorph. These can be found in the Education tab in our main menu. We have Life Through the Ages virtual dioramas for Paleozoic and Mesozoic time periods, with Cenozoic exhibits coming soon. I'll dive right into the Permian Sea to give you a quick tour. You can modify the resolution, rotate and pan the scene with mouse clicks, and use different navigation to move through this ancient ocean. We have annotated different specimens throughout the scene, and these annotations provide you with more information and also links out to our own fossil specimen models. This provides context for artistic reconstructions of specimens, but also provides access to the physical specimens that we hold in our collections. We hope you'll take the time to explore the ancient oceans and terrestrial scenes that we have provided. We also encourage you to provide feedback as these are in beta testing. All right, and we're back live. That was an awesome look into your uh, organization's collections. Oh yeah, thank you. That <laughs> ammonite was awesome. <laughs> oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, it's really so cool to see predator-prey interactions in the fossil record. When when <laughs> the first time you saw that in your collection, what was like, was that like a whoa moment? Yeah, it's a pretty famous specimen, so I, I recognized it, and it was really cool to like compare it to the to the other kind of pristine specimens, and also show it off when people come and see if they recognize it and gauge kind of their excitement over over the fossil. That's so cool. Being a collections manager, you must have a lot of like moments when you open a drawer and you're just like, "That is so cool." Yeah, definitely. Practically every time I open a drawer, um, I think I said in the video, there's like over 550 cabinets and each cabinet is filled with drawers so each time i like go to look for something it's like a new adventure mm -hmm. <laughs> that's awesome all right you ready for some questions yes all right Brittany. let's see what we got let's see what we have um there's a lot of cool comments on those virtual dioramas basic um by the way um so for these kinds of collections um since it is a university, who can access them? Um, is it limited to students at the university? Can uh, local fossil enthusiasts see the collections? Like, how does that work um, in, at your university? Yeah, great question. So there are a couple ways that anyone can come and work on or look at specimens. Usually it's by appointment only. Currently, uh, we're closed to all external visitors. Uh, but if uh, any internal people need to come over and look at something, they can. But on a normal basis, uh, just setting up an appointment because our facility, you need access to get in so we can meet you and kind of take you through the space. Usually it's visiting researchers and scholars, like somebody who's, say, interested in a specific type of brachiopod will email us and ask about what we have and if they could come visit or if we could loan them specimens. And that's usually how it goes. Awesome. Here's a, uh, another good question. This is from Grant. How uh... How much does your collection grow annually? Um, I think we all know as museum professionals, we're constantly getting in collections and museum collections aren't something that remains static and they're just constantly growing. So what does that look like for your collection? 
Yeah, another great question. So currently we're not growing as much as we originally were. So there was a lot of really large collecting events early on in the museum's history. So like um, early 1900s. And this is like when researchers or curators would go out for field uh, excursions and then they'd bring back lots of specimens. So we have a lot of that from early on and then that kind of petered out around the 70s. And it's a little bit less about expanding and getting targeted collections or we have a really dedicated group of uh, collectors in the area called the Friends of the UMMP, and many of them donate specimens that they find, um, and many of them are the experts in, in the fauna and know the value of the specimens and are very happy to, to provide science in the museum with those specimens. So we're not growing in any kind of rapid amount. It's a little bit more tailored to match what we have or augment uh, our collections in some way. Awesome. Um, for that, like, has has uh, the global pandemic affected you in any way as a collections manager and like working in a museum? Yeah, definitely. So at first, uh, we could come in like one day a week to check on like our HVAC systems and do some cleaning, make sure everything is okay. Um, I come into work a couple of days a week now, but the other times I'm at home and I'm largely like a digital data manager. So I. I'm cleaning up our database, digitizing, working with students, making 3D models. Uh, but it's been weird not being with the specimens because that's something that I, I enjoy very much. <laughs> For a while, when we were when we were in lockdown too, you know, I was doing mostly work from home, and there was a point where I was like, I just wanna I just wanna hold the fossil again. Mm -hmm. I, I just missed it. Yeah, I remember the first time um, after we were allowed to occasionally with safety precautions go back um, into the office when we needed to. And I just kind of went into the exhibits and sat there for a moment. I was like, oh, I missed you. I missed this. <laughs> it was like, you know, remember in uh, Little Mermaid when she's like part of your world, we're all like singing that as we're looking at our collections. <laughs> Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? <laughs> all right. Here's, here's a great question from Nathan. What is the weirdest or most surprising thing that you've seen in the collections? Ooh. I know, it's a tough question. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe most surprising. Uh, so something that uh, is kind of on one of our um, large pallets on our, we have like a, a rack for oversized specimens. Uh, but when I first got to the museum, there was uh, a pallet on the floor and on the pallet was a dinosaur footprint, which is very exciting. However, I take care of the Shelleys, not the dinosaurs. Uh, so that was kind of alarming. Like, what is this big footprint doing here? But I later found out through, I don't even remember how exactly, but one of our collectors had donated it. And I, I guess it just ended up there because he gave it to the previous invertebrate collection manager. But yeah, I was shocked to find, I was like, I came here for the shells only. <laughs> One of these things doesn't belong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Are there any other good questions? Did you have so, any questions for social media, Gabe? Yeah. Or um, someone was asking where the why the plastic gloves or why you were wearing the gloves during the collection. I think they probably were just watching without audio. Oh yeah. Um, so we have a variety of protocol in place. Uh, due to COVID, um, so to make sure that we're not uh, inadvertently being vectors and touching objects uh, with our bare hands. So every time we touch specimens, we put on an, a pair of gloves, and if I change rooms, I put on a different pair of gloves. Uh, so it's just a safety precaution. And um, while I was filming, I was also wearing a mask. Um, you just can't see that because I was not in most of the shots. All right, cool. Um, I think we're done with questions on social media. Um, anything else, Britt? I think that's it. All right, cool. Well, thank you, Jen, so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you both for having me. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, Britt, you want to close us out? 
Sure, give me one moment. So thank you everybody for joining us. If you would like to um, support the Western Science Center or the ALF Museum or follow us in the rest of our endeavors, there's going to be links to do that in the description. And make sure to hit like and subscribe to get um, notifications for all of our future videos and we'll have more videos today. All right, bye everybody. We'll see you at 10 a.m. for uh, the University of Montana with Callie Moore. Thank you, everybody.